Hello everyone, welcome to VTU e-learning program. Under this platform, so we are going to start with uh, the subject design of RCC and steel structures. Myself, Dr. K. Mahesh Prabhu, head of the research center, Government Engineering College, Ramnagara, from Civil Engineering Department. So in this section, let us discuss about the introduction of combined footing, which is on the material RCC. So to begin with, let us understand what is a combined footing. A combined footing is the one, as you can see in the image, which is displayed over here, this particular element, which is of RCC in material, is called as combined footing, which supports the load coming over the two different columns, which are placed very close to each other. So look at this diagram. So this particular image represents an isolated footing for which one single column is been provided with the footing which is the foundation for the RCC structure. So now coming to this, you can see that there are two columns which is been provided with one single RCC footing. So that part is supporting the entire structure for its load being transferred from its two columns. So hence, with differentiating between an isolated footing and a combined footing, we can understand the physical differences between the foundation of the two structures. So this is your combined footing. So this is an isolated footing. So with this introduction, so let us begin to understand how this is been defined. A combined footing is a foundation which is used to support the loads of two adjacent columns. So now the question arises, when do we need this combined footing? So the need of this combined footing arises whenever the individual footings get overlapped. And this overlapping will be for two or more reasons. Number one is due to the overlap due to the adjacent columns because of the position being too close to each other. The second criteria is when the overlap happens because of the low bearing capacity of the soil. The third criteria is overlap due to the high intensity or the magnitude of the individual column loads. So now coming to the second one, so the, if there is any restrictions with the property line, so in that case the column is very closely located to the property line. And also when the width of the footing is so far it is restricted because of the geometrical nature. So that is maybe due to even for architectural purpose. And lastly, if you want to avoid the eccentricity of the column type, then we may have to go to the combined footing. So these are the factors which governs the need for the combined footing. So now let us discuss about how the combined footing is going to behave when it compared to the ordinary isolated footing. So this profile shows the bending behavior of the combined footing. So as the load on a single column A and column B is towards acting downwards, 
So that creates the pressure below the foundation soil. So since the pressure is acting upwards and there is a point or a concentrated load through the column which is coming downwards, the footing is going to be lifted on the either extreme end of the length A as well as on the length B. And between the two columns there is also the upward pressure which is acting through the soil. So hence the footing is going to behave as a flexural element in this fashion. So this can be accorded for an inverted overhang beam. So hence there is a tension exactly below the point load and as well as at this location. So whereas here it is again the tension. So with this we have understood the flexural behavior of the combined footing in its longitudinal direction. So now let us check with the transverse direction. So in transverse direction either at column A or at column B the footing is going to behave as a cantilever beam. So hence the free end is going to be lifted up right from the extreme end to the other extreme end. So with this understanding of the combined footing in both the directions that is on longitudinal direction as well as the transverse direction. So let us further focus on how it has to be designed. So now as we talked about in the previous slides, because of the force acting on the column A and column B downwards, there is likely to be the pressure that is created in the upward direction in the foundation soil. So now this pressure distribution that is P1 and P2 is going to be uniform if, if F1 is equal to F2. So there are certain conditions where F1 may not be equal to F2. So this particular pressure distribution diagram is valid for F1 is equal to F2. So now let us see what is going to happen for the upward soil pressure when F1 is not equal to F2. So there may be a case where F1 is less than F2 or it can be F1 greater than F2. So in both the case F1 is not equal to F2. So in such cases the pressure distribution diagram so P1 is lesser than P2. So P1 is lesser than P2. So hence the upward soil pressure acting in the foundation soil could be a triangle or it could be a trapezium. So it can be equal to 0 or it can be less than 0. So both are possible. So in such cases, in most of the practical cases, F1 is never equal to F2. So in such cases, let us see how the beam or the slab which has been provided as the combined footing is going to behave. So with this, let us focus on how to design a slab type combined footing having given the two different behaviors as F1 is equal to F2 and F1 is not equal to F2. So as a design procedure of the slab type combined footing, so we do have listed as 1 to 6 being the 
design steps. So, where the very outset first we need to determine the area of combined footing that is required to be provided for the given loading conditions. The next is we need to plan the diamonds of the footing in such a way that we can arrive at the uniform upward soil pressure and then distribute it uniformly throughout the length so that the behavior is more symmetrical. Next at step number 3 we have to determine the net upward soil pressure which may be uniform, it may be uniform, sorry, it may be uniform in case of F1 is equal to F2 or we may have to plan the dimensioning in such a way that we get the footing pressure is uniform under the footing slab. So, with this we move on to analyze the structure that is footing structure and obtain its BMD and SFD. So, once we are done with the BMD and SFD then we are going ahead with designing the footing slab for RCC. So, it is RCC. So, finally, once the footing is designed for the bending, then we need to check the footing slab for the shear capacity. Whether the design footing is sufficient enough to sustain the shear for which it has been subjected to, so that it is safe under one way and two way shear. So, with this we conclude that the design chronological order has to be followed based on step number 1 to step number 6. So, now let us see on 1 to 1 and understand how we go about step number 1 to step number 6 in detail. Step number 1 is to determine the area of footing required. So, to determine the area of footing required we do have the equation which is equal to the total final load acting on the footing divided by SBC of soil. So, now the total load on the footing is equal to the two loads that is coming on footing number 1 and footing number 2 that is F1 and F2 and the final load is with the total load plus an additional load of 10 percent, 10 percent of this particular total which accounts to the self weight of the footing, self weight of So, now at this point of time the self weight of footing is not being known because we are not fixed at what should be the size of the footing and its thickness of the footing. So, hence to accommodate for the future self weight of the footing. So, we are going to provide it as a numerical value of 10 percent which accounts for the entire self weight of the combined footing. So, with this the equation will work out to 1.1 times of F1 to F2. So, which accounts for the 10 percent additional load due to the self weight of the combined footing. So, therefore, the final equation of area which has to be required to be provided for the footing that is combined footing is equal to 1.5 times of F1 plus F2 divided by SBC of 
soil. So once we are done with step number one, then we can plan the dimensioning of the footing slab in such a way that we get the uniform upward soil pressure acting on the footing element so that the behavior becomes behavior of the footing becomes uniform and symmetric. So now let us see what is happening in step number 2. So this is the figure which represents the plan of the combined footing wherein the longitudinal dimension is the length and the transverse direction is the width B. So now having known the position of the columns been declared as S1 from the extreme left hand side, S2 being the extreme right hand side spacing and S being the spacing between the two columns that is F1 and you have to where the load is being transferred. So with this we can identify what exactly is the footing being provided in terms of the area in plan, plan area. So equating the area of footing required to the area of footing provided. So we do have the area of the footing in plan being rectangle in shape which is equal to B into L. So B into L. So, having fixing one of the dimensions either B or either L, in most of the cases it is not E, it is not B because if F1 is not equal to F2 then we may have to plan the dimensioning of the footing slab in such a fashion that, such a fashion that we get the net upward soil pressure as the uniform one. So let us discuss that in the next slides. So how to get the uniform net upward soil pressure? So this is possible only if you plan the dimension in such a fashion that the resultant force due to the external actions that is F1 and F2 passes through the centroid of the footing in plan. So that is this dimension which is equal to L by 2. So if we plan the size of the footing in such a way that the resultant R due to F1 and the F2 is coinciding with the center of the length of the footing then we are in a position that we can say that the uniform upward soil pressure from the extreme left end to the extreme right end is possibly the uniform with that we are going to achieve. So hence it becomes most important for the designer to determine the position x of the resultant force r. So how do we do that? How do we determine the resultant force r? So the resultant force r is the summation of the total force which is coming downwards as the action forces, external action forces that is F1 plus F2. So where r is equal to F1 plus F2 since both are acting downwards so it is going to be summed up. So now once the magnitude of R is identified then we can determine the position X the position X of the resultant force where it is acting exactly from the center of the column A that is where force F1 is acting. So hence this diagram represents F1 that is the center line of the column which is towards my left. So with this let us see how the 
position x which is from the center line of the column can be represented. So now S1 plus X, X is equal to L by 2 where S1 is the spacing between the extreme left hand portion of the combined footing till the center line of the column of the left hand portion of the column A. So now how to determine this X? So let us see that with the next coming portion. So now with this condition X can be determined from simple mechanics. So what is the mechanics that, that is involved? By taking the moment, taking moment about point center line of the column A, we do have the equation that is R into X should be equal to F2 into S. So hence X can be written as what? F2 into S divided by X, sorry. So F2 into S divided by R. So in the previous slide we have determined what exactly is the magnitude of R. So once we have the R then F2 is being known from the data. S is also from the data. So hence X can be easily determined by measuring the moment about point the center line of the column A. So with this, once if we are done with X, then finally we can incorporate this value as is equal to S1 plus X should be equal to L by 2. So once this portion is determined, then the remaining portion is L minus of the value what we have been calculated. So with this the final load which is coming over the footing which is measured in terms of pressure P1 and P2 will be uniform. So hence P1 and P2 will be uniform only if you make that S1 plus X should be equal to L by 2 that is half of the length of the combined footing. So now let us understand the simple mechanism of converting the non-uniform net upward soil pressure into uniform upward soil pressure so that our design or the behavior of the combined footing in bending will be uniform in nature and symmetric so that the stability and the safety of the combined footing structure becomes more stable and more safe. So once we have done with this, we can convert the pressure into the loading conditions by just having the magnitude being transferred converting the pressure into UDL, converting the pressure into UDL that is W. So how do we do that? So once the pressure P1 and P2 is same that is uniform in across the length of the longitudinal footing, so wherein we can term that as P, both P1 and P2 is equal to P. So Converting this into the load is by multiplying the pressure intensity into the other dimension which is perpendicular to this board. So what I need is I require W in longitudinal direction. So if I require the magnitude being converted from pressure into load intensity along one direction, so the other dimension has to be multiplied with the pressure intensity to get the 
load intensity. So that is what exactly is being done in the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. So this is what we are talking about. So the load intensity is being achieved by just multiplying the pressure intensity in one dimension to the other dimension. So since I need the load across the length of the combined footing, the other dimension is perpendicular to this board which is B. So hence the pressure intensity is multiplied with the other dimension which is perpendicular to the board B to the board which is B. Mm -hmm. So hence we achieve the load intensity along the length of the combined footing. So now since B here it can be of its original dimension or it can also be taken as for one full meter length. So in this equation, so it has been stated that B is equivalent to 1 meter length. So hence the load intensity is calculated as P kilonewton per meter length. Since 1 is what is being given as the magnitude of B, so hence the load intensity is just the load intensity is just P kilonewton per meter length of the combined footing. So once we have done with determining the load intensity acting on the upward direction of the combined footing, then we can analyze the combined footing as a double cantilever overhang beam and we can draw the SFD and BMD. So now it is a very simple uh, determinate uh, structure where we can analyze this particular element beam as a beam element for 1 meter length and 1 meter width sorry 1 meter width and then we can draw the BMD and SFD through our ordinary 3 equations of equilibrium. So hence in step number 4 we are going to obtain SFD and BMD by analyzing the simple determinate structure which has been subjected to two point loads acting downwards and subjected to W kilonewton per meter distance on the upward direction. So with this we have shear force being 0 at A and at D whereas exactly at column number 1 and column number 2 we do have the magnitude where one of the magnitude will be maximum either at B or either at C which again depends on F1 and F2. So now once if we have this shear force diagram we can develop the bending moment diagram where exactly the maximum bending moment will be exactly along the dimension x where the shear force is minimum or it could be changing from negative to positive direction. So hence identifying the salient features using our simple engineering mechanics of where exactly is the position of the maximum bending moment. position of maximum bending moment and position of the change of negative bending moment to the positive bending moment. So it can be negative or it can be positive. So we are done with the analysis so that we can design our reinforcement for the extreme bending as well as for the extreme shear conditions. Okay. So now once understanding the analysis and getting the bending moment and shear force diagram on our design calculations. So we do have critical values as from different locations as you could see on the board that is M1 exactly below the column number 1. M2 being at column number 2, M3 being the maximum bending moment. 
and its location has to be traced from x is equal to v0 where v0 represents the zero shear force. So now with this we have the entire analysis being complete for the planned geometrically planned combined footing of slab type. So then we can pitch in for determining the reinforcement. So now coming to the next transverse direction. So as we discussed in the earlier slides, transverse reinforce, transverse direction, the combined footing is going to behave as the cantilever type. So wherein one single downward force either F1 or F2 depending upon the location is going to act downwards and creates the upward soil pressure and this upward soil pressure can be converted into upward soil force and we can easily analyze the cantilever beam where the maximum bending moment is exactly at the support and at exactly on the free end the zero bending moment. So hence along the transverse direction we need to identify what is the transfer shears as well as the transfer bending moment. So now consolidating all these four values, three on the previous slides, that is M1, M2 and M3 and V1 and V2 on the longitudinal direction. On the transverse direction, we do have Vt and Mt. So totally put, putting together as four bending moment values and three shear four values, shear force values. So with this, we choose the maximum bending moment and we are going to provide the other dimension of the footing that is in y direction which is called as the thickness or the depth of the combined footing. So now once if you are done with the combined footing depth then we can use IS456 for calculating what exactly the reinforcement is required to provide at various critical sections. So one is the tension where exactly below the column number A, the second one is in between the columns which is again the hogging and then below the column number B. So hence depending upon the bending moment diagram what we have been analyzed based on the loads that is coming downwards from point sorry column number 1 and column number 2. So we are going to identify the locations of the reinforcement that has to be provided for the critical bending security or the safety so that the concrete should not crack and fail. So with this we are going to provide what is AST1, AST2 and AST3 which represents the reinforcement area of different magnitudes and then cross checking this with this with less than AST minimum. AST minimum. So now all these values has to be cross checked with the minimum AST that has been represented by IS456 equations. So once if this is achieved then we can conclude that the entire combined footing is been taken care by the reinforcement for which it has to be provided for the tension zones. So next once the design is complete for the bending that is for the tension then we can finally pitch in for the step number 6 which is for the shear check. So before shear check we need to get into for the transverse bending. So where since it is only a single direction bending so we have to provide only the reinforcement at the bottom. So with this we conclude the design of combined footing in both the direction for bending. So the next is shear design. So in case of the slab we are not going to design for shear. We are not going to design for shear. We are going to check for shear. 
that means the difference between the design and check is in terms of providing the reinforcement. So if we are designing the RCC element then we are going to provide the reinforcement. If we are not going to design then we are not going to provide the reinforcement. So hence in all slab elements we see that it has to be checked for shear either in one direction or either in two directions. But both the directions are very critical because of its nature of behavior. So in one way shear check the procedure is we need to identify the critical section for one way shear and then we need to assess the stresses that is going to be generated due to the applied forces of both action and reactions and once these stresses are within the limit of the stresses that has to be taken care by the design concrete then we could conclude that the shear check is safe. So now let us see how to go about and achieve this particular shear check. So now in case of one way shear it is checked at a section which is called as a critical section and that is exactly at a distance d from the face of the column. So now in plan we do have all the dimensions that is been planned accordingly and the critical section is at one way. So which is exactly measured at a distance d where d is the effective depth of the slab that we have been provided and this dimension is measured from the face of the column towards my left. So hence the remaining portion which is the hatched portion is the left out portion which is free to get lifted up by the upward soil force. So hence the hatched portion is the one which is free to move upward for our shear actions. So hence once if we have identified the critical section then we need to determine what exactly is the shear stress that this section is going to be subjected to. So now according to IS456, so we have the equations as well as the table been given to determine the nominal shear stress at the critical section. that has to be identified as well as with the design shear stress. So this design shear stress of the designed grade of concrete depends on the reinforcement that is being provided in that particular critical section. So now in critical section 1 1 we do have AST 1 as the reinforcement that is being provided. So based on the AST 1 we calculate what is PT1 that is percentage of steel that is being provided. So based on the percentage of steel that is provided at section 1 1 the design shear stress of the concrete can be ascertained. So now once the design shear stress is ascertained from this elaborated view we can see that this is the hatchet portion where exactly the shear failure is going to happen because of the free movement of this part wherein the remaining portion is stable because of the two forces coming down and balancing. So now once tau C value that is the design shear stress of concrete is identified for the given PT of the reinforcement then we can calculate what is the balance design shear that is acting on the critical section. So if there is a balance then it has to be designed. So if there is no balance that means if the design shear stress is greater than the nominal shear stress then no need of providing the reinforcement for the shear. So hence 
for the slab we should see that the quantity that is the magnitude of nominal shear stress is always lesser than the design shear stress that we calculate from our design calculation based on the steel that we have provided at the critical section. Similarly, the same critical section is also available at the other portion of the combined footing because of the dimensions that S1 may not be equal to S2. So, since both the dimensions are not same, so hence L1 is not equal to L2. So, where L1 is on the left hand side and L2 is on the left hand side based on our critical sections. So, hence it has to be checked for all the possible directions in plan where we can measure D from this end, we can also measure D from this end as well as for this portion. So, hence there are four sections that are possible that is 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, four sections are possible to identify the design critical shear stress. So, now to choose whoever is greater among these four, we can identify that with L1, L2, L3 and so on. So, based on the dimensions what we have identified from section 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 and 4, 4. So, we can conclude that whether L1 is greater than L2 or L3 or L4. So, based on this we can calculate the maximum design shear stress that is possible based on the 3 or 4 dimensions. So, as you can see here we discussed that section 3 3 is also possible. Similarly, section 4 4 is may also be possible if the 2 is not symmetrical. So, if it is symmetrical along direction the transverse direction then only section 3 3 is available. Section 4 4 may also be have the same dimensions. So, with this we conclude the shear check for one way. So, next is two way shear check. So, in two directional shear now we are going to consider the critical area in all four particular dimensions that is B naught and L naught. So, now the critical section here it is measured as at a distance D by 2 from the face of the column. So, D by 2 is the distance which is measured from the face of the column and either directions of the column in plan. So, once we locate this and join the critical line path then it is again a rectangle. It could be a rectangle or it could be a square that depends again on the column shape. So, since in this figure it is rectangle, the column is rectangle. So, hence the critical path is also a rectangle. So, now this hatched portion is the one which is going to be failed in two way shear because of the net upward soil pressure acting directly on the combined footing. So, now again to choose this we do have two number of criteria. One is below column number 1 and next is below column number 2. So, among these two locations if column number 2 is subjected to the maximum downward force column load then the critical section will be below the highest column load. So, hence the section is selected below the column number 2 where F2 is the maximum magnitude that is going to be subjected to in the combined footing design. So, hence the two way critical section is obtained for the given drawing 
here represents column 2 and declares that the column 2 is the highest load compared to column number 1. So, with this we calculate the dimension parameters that is B0 and L0 where B0 is equal to the column dimension plus 2 times of D by 2. Similarly, L0 is the column dimension along this longitudinal direction plus d by 2 into 2 times. So, having known this, we can calculate the area of the critical section B0 into L0 which resists the two way shear. So, hence the load F2 divided by the area will give you the critical shear stress acting on the critical section. So, this critical shear stress has to be lesser than the concrete compre, sorry concrete shear stress that is been calculated based on the area of reinforcement that we have been designed. So, if this particular shear check is performed then we can say the shear stress the design combined footing is also safe in two way shear. So, with this we conclude the design procedure, the introduction part of the design procedure for the slab type combined footing with a brief introduction of what exactly is the design procedure. Thank you and let us continue with the next session. Thank you very much.